namo tassa bhagavato rahato samma sambuddhassa namo tassa bhagavato rahato samma sambuddhassa namo tassa bhagavato rahato samma sambuddhassa bereavement services is a very important part of people's life and in many Buddhist temples or monasteries, monks are in high demand to conduct bereavement services. In Samananjong, many of the Sri Lankan temples have to import monks from Sri Lanka in order to meet the high demands of our local Buddhists. If we look in the Pali scriptures, in the suttas, conducting memorial or bereavement services is not part of the duty of a monk. There are stories and accounts in the Pali scriptures of monks being invited to people who are dying who are about to die or lying in their deathbed. And we see how the monks go there to speak the Dhamma, to advise or inspire those dying persons so that they can have a good death. But there is no account to be found in the Pali scriptures of monks attending funerals. And also in the Vinyapitaka, there are no duties ascribed to monks on how to conduct bereavement or memorial services. The only reference to what the monks should do after someone dies is that pertaining to the death of a fellow monk. There is a story of a monk called Bahia, he was actually a renunciant of another sect, or rather, he renounced himself. One day, he was urged by a deva, according to the commentary, to look for the Buddha, because the deva told him that he was not an arahant, although he thought that he was, or he pretended that he was one. So he went to Sawati to see the Buddha. At that time, the Buddha was going on arms round, begging for arms. He went to the monastery and looked for the Buddha, and he was told that the Buddha went on arms round, so he went to Sawati to look for the Buddha while the Buddha was going on arms round. And then he met the Buddha, going on arms round, and he implored the Buddha to teach him the Dhamma in brief. The Buddha refused him and said, this is not the right time, I'm going on my arms round. But this Bahiya insisted. For the second time, he implored the Buddha to teach him. And for the third time, he implored the Buddha to teach him the Dhamma in brief. Finally, the Buddha relented and gave him very brief instructions. The very famous instructions. He said, In the scene, there shall only be the scene. In the herd, there shall only be the herd. In the sensed, there shall only be the sensed. In the cognized, there shall only be the cognized. If you are able to practice that way, then you will not be here, nor there, nor in between. And that shall be the end of suffering. These are very cryptic instructions which most of us will not be able to understand. Anyway, he understood. And then, according to the commentary, he asked to be ordained as the Buddha's disciple, become a Buddhist monk. And then the Buddha said, well, to be ordained as a Buddhist monk, you need to have a bow and ropes. He didn't have any. He was wearing 
three bark as his clothing. That's because he was not a Buddhist ascetic, but was another external ascetic. So he went to search for his rope and a bowl in order to get ordained. As he left the Buddha, he was got to death by a cow. According to the commentary, this cow was possessed by a yaka, which, who was a past enemy, who wanted to take his revenge on Bahia, probably because he had offended or harmed him in the past life. So he got him and he died. And he did not have a chance to get ordination from the Buddha himself. Then later, the monks, when they went on arms round, they spotted his body by the roadside. And they asked the Buddha, Now this person, Bahia, who had gotten instructions from the Buddha, has just been caught to death by a cow. What has happened to him? Where is he now? And then the Buddha said, He is very intelligent and of swift knowledge because he already understood the Dhamma and he he had become an Arahant. Just by listening to the very short instructions by the Buddha, he had already become an Arahant. And so he is one of your brothers, one of those living the holy life. So the Buddha said, make a stupa for him. Although he was not a bhikkhu, but because he was an Arahant, and he became an Arahant in the Buddha's presence. He was probably the only posthumous bhikkhu that we can ever find in the suttas. That's about the only place where the Buddha gave any instructions to monks on what to do to a person who has died. And this is an Arahant. Ask the monks to make a stupa for him. Didn't ask them to chant or do anything. <laughs> He's an Arahant and he don't need any chanting. You might wonder... How is it that nowadays monks are doing this pastoral or priestly duty of going chanting during funerals, during bereavement services and memorial services? Now I use the word bereavement and memorial in a distinct way. Bereavement is when a person dies. That is a ceremony that is done before or during the funeral. And a memorial service is when you do a seven day, seven seven, a hundred days, and so forth. This is Chinese custom, and uh, during those days, they would usually invite monks to come and chant. The way I understand how this evolved into being is due to the history and evolution of Buddhism in India. As you all know. Before Buddhism became very popular in India, the prevalent religion was Brahmanism, what we call now Hinduism, but it's actually Brahmanism. And the Brahmins are a priestly class. They are determined by birth, by caste. If you are born a Brahmin, you are given the responsibility of preserving the teachings of the Vedas, of the Brahmins, through oral memorization. Because at those times there were no books and all their scriptural knowledge was perpetuated by recitation, memory work. And the Brahmins also are priestly class where they act as intermediaries in order to communicate with the gods one has to go to a Brahmin priest. You cannot make offerings straight to the deity or to the god. You must always go through this intermediary, a middleman. That's how they made their living. Even the kings had to depend on the Brahmins to perform sacrifices and all this uh, divinity to ensure their um, conquest and maintaining their power. They are all dependent on the Brahmins. So too were the people. The people all depended on the Brahmin priests to conduct their their religious services. But Buddhism had a complete absence of such rites and rituals. 
if you look at the Pali scriptures, most of the suttas were addressed to monks, asking them to practice meditation, to practice sila, samadhi and panya, morality, samadhi and wisdom, in order to be liberated from samsara, to be free from suffering. Although in the Anguttara Nikaya, there are many suttas which are addressed to lay people on how to conduct themselves in life so that they can be reborn in a good realm of existence after death and on how they can prosper in life. But there were hardly any rituals. Although in Sigalowara Sutta and the Diga Nikaya, it is supposed to be the responsibility and obligation of children to make offerings to their departed relatives, their departed parents regularly. No details were given how they were to make these. When Buddhism became a popular religion, actually Buddhism was not initially a religion. It was actually a way of life, a way of life to practice so that you can be liberated from suffering. But this appeals only to a minority of people. The majority of people are not that spiritually matured to aim towards such an ultimate goal. They are more mundane, they are more interested in worldly gains, worldly prosperity, and uh, religious services to smoothen their life in samsara. Eventually what happened was when Buddhism became a mass religion, a popular religion, then there is this vacuum. There was no priest. Because the monks were all studying and practicing meditation, they don't attend to the lay people. The lay people, before they became Buddhists, they were Hindus. They were followers of the Brahmin religion. They depended on the, the Brahmin priests as intermediaries. But now, once they become Buddhists, there are no priests. So it became a vacuum. And that water finds its own level. Eventually, the monks became priests in order to fill this vacuum. That's why in Sri Lanka, in the old days it's called Ceylon, when the Europeans came to colonize Ceylon, they went to places where monks stayed and they called these places temples. And they call these monks priests. Call them monasteries, they don't call them monks. Because they were not behaving or conducting themselves as monks. They were practicing as priests. So they were called priests by the Europeans. And there are places where they stayed were called temples. Just like this is temple with Buddha statue and all that. In the early days, soon after the Buddha passed away, for the first 500 years, there were no Buddha statues. These came in much later due to Buddhism becoming a religion of the masses. And the majority of people are not spiritually matured to aim for the highest ultimate goal of liberation of Nibbana, but they are more interested in mundane affairs, mundane prosperity and progress and security and riches. And they looked upon Buddha as another deity, another god. And even now in Traditional Buddhist countries like Burma, Thailand and Sri Lanka, a lot of people go to the stupas, go in front of Buddha image to pray for something they want in life, some worldly thing. Correct? Even when they come and give food to monks, sometimes when after they give food to monks, you can see them close their eyes and they will be dead. you know that they are making a vow. By this merit, may I get this, may I get this, may my son pass the exam and so forth. Correct? <laughs> In Penang, Mahindarama Buddhist temple, Sri Lankan temple, they have a Bodhi tree outside. And the Bodhi tree, they have a glass cabinet where students who want to sit for their exams will write pieces of paper and then put it inside there like Ang Pao, you know, making a wish that they can pass their exam with flying colors. <laughs> and then they have special exam services. Oh, students who want to see for their exams, they ask the monk to come, the monk will bless them and do chanting. Give them special power to pass their exams. <laughs> that's why it's called a temple, because that's what these monks are doing. They're, they're acting like priests. 
That's why in Sri Lanka you have these such titles like Chief High Priest. This is a very typical Sri Lankan title, influenced by the colonial times. Because when the colonialists came, they didn't see monks, they saw priests. They didn't see monasteries, they saw temples. People coming to pray rather than monks studying and practicing meditation. But anyway, the state of affairs right now is that Buddhist monks are somehow involved in bereavement and memorial services. When a close member of the family passes away, the living members of the family are in a state of shock, especially when the death is a sudden one, heart attack, or die of cancer within a few weeks, or die in an accident. When the living members, the surviving members, are in a state of shock, there is no lack of people who will come to give the advice on what to do. I remember when my grandma or my father passed away, and there were lots of relatives who came in to give their unsolicited advice. You should do this, you should do this, you should invite the Naumolo, you should invite the Mahayana monk, you should invite the Theravada monk and Kyasu. You invite everybody, just to please everybody, in case something goes wrong. <laughs> People do that for a few reasons. One is fear. Fear that the loved one might not move on to a good place because of insufficient or incorrect funeral procedures. That's one fear. Another fear is that they fear that there will be a reprisal. If they don't do according to the wishes of the dead, then the deceased will come and haunt them. Their family will be affected and they will not prosper and they will be unlucky. Correct? A lot of people are motivated by fear. <laughs> they are afraid that they might do the wrong thing, they might get into trouble. So that's why they do all these things. And that's when all these undertakers, they will take advantage of the situation. I remember when my grandma passed away, these undertakers were saying that you must give all the valuable things put inside the coffin. And then when they take the body out, you cannot turn back, cannot look back. You know what they're doing? I looked back and I saw them, they took away all the valuables. <laughs> <laughs> Better things, what do they do? You burn paper houses for the dead, right? Nowadays you burn also the drivers, as well as a motor car, as well as a touch and go, as well as credit card, as well as handphone. <laughs> got iPhone also. <laughs> and people buy all that. <laughs> because of fear. They are afraid that they might do something wrong, they are afraid that the deceased might not be able to move on smoothly. It's all fear and ignorance. For us in SBS, Sasanaraka Buddhist Century, after so many years of experience, we don't actually go out to do bereavement or memorial service for any Tom, Dick and Harry. We only do so for our close supporters, our regulars, those people who come regularly to support us, to do dana, to listen to Dhamma talk, and help out in the running of the monastery. Why? Because if you were just to entertain every Tom, Dick and Harry, Everybody who die, <laughs> every family will come after us. And we'll be so busy going out chanting like the Sri Lankan monks that we won't have time to do our own study and practice. So we only limit that to our close supporters. How one conducts a bereavement service also depends on what you believe in. Orthodox Theravadins believe that Rebirth occurs immediately after death. But the Tibetans and the Chinese believe that there is an intermediate state in between. And the Chinese are influenced by the Tibetans to believe that there is this seven sevens, 49 days. That's why, based on this belief, the Chinese have memorial service after seven days, after 49 days, after 100 days, and so forth. If you follow a strict Theravadin bereavement service based on Orthodox Theravada belief, there is no necessity to do this memorial service. You just do it once. Because after death, you will be reborn immediately. However, real life stories of people who experience 
what happens after a close member of the family dies shows us that in most cases, when people die suddenly, then they tend to hang around. They don't go away. They are not reborn immediately. They hang around because they either they are not aware that they are dead or they are not willing to go because they have very strong attachments. There's two main reasons. There's a couple of stories. There's one story of one yogi who came from Johor to Penang to Malaysian Buddhist Meditation Center for a meditation retreat. Soon after she arrived, she died in the meditation center. And that was at night. She died maybe about 7, 8 o'clock. But it was so late at night, they had to contact the next of kin. And so the body had to be put in the meditation hall. And there were other yogis there. And some of the yogis could actually see that the yogi who had died didn't know that she was dead because she was still doing walking meditation in the hall. <laughs> she was still doing walking meditation. Then there is also another case. This happened in Taiping. You know this bottle mineral water called Spritzer? It's just opposite our Sasnaraka Buddhist sanctuary. And they have some Burmese workers staying there. But the Burmese workers were all very young people and they were not very religious. Although the place was quite near to our monastery, none of the Burmese youths had ever come to do dana or were interested in Buddhism. One day, a new Burmese worker passed away soon after he arrived. He had a very high fever and he passed away. And his body was put in a mortuary in Taiping. I think he just about a month after he arrived. And so he was quite new and he didn't have many friends there. But after he died, his spirit, this ghost, was haunting the quarters where the Burmese stayed. And some of the Burmese workers could perceive or see him. And they said that this ghost was going around asking them for help. Say, I don't know, what am I supposed to do? Where am I supposed to go? He doesn't know that he's dead. He doesn't know what to do. You know, he's hanging around here. The Burmese, being young people who were not religious, they didn't know what to do. Well, luckily, there was an Indian worker there who knew me and came to our monastery and told us about this and asked us to help. So we went over one day and the Burmese workers had prepared some food for us. And the moment I stepped into the quarters, into the uh, reception hall, I had goose pimples all over. <laughs> the moment I stepped in, I already felt this energy, so I told my monks, okay, don't do anything, just sit down and send metta. So we just sat down and we just sent metta to the being. After we did some metta, then the Burmese did some food dana. After they gave dana, we chanted metta sutta, karuniya metta, and I uh, gave a talk in Burmese. The way we give dhamma talk in SBS during bereavement service is, one, first of all, to talk to the deceased. To tell the deceased that you are dead now. You are no longer in the human world. But you may perceive us because your spirit is still around. If your spirit is still hanging around, you may perceive us, you may hear us, you may see us, but we cannot see you. And it might be very frustrating to you. But you are not part of this world anymore. And it is best for you not to have any attachments to this world and move on to a better world. Think of the good deeds that you have done and try not to be attached to your loved ones. Also, forgive all those people who have offended you and don't hold any grudges and also ask those who are living to forgive you if you have offended them. 
We say this to the deceased and we also say this to the living. Because if the living, the surviving members of the family, have very strong attachments to the deceased, wishing that they should still be around, that could also hold them back. Even though the deceased is willing to let go, if the surviving members still hang on, so cling, they cannot go. So I spoke in Burmese, I told the ghost of this Burmese worker, I said, you are no longer of this world. Although you can see us, we cannot see you. And if you still hang around, there's no benefit for you. And you are also frightening your friends. Now that they have done some dana for you, and we are going to share merits, and they have done dana to uh, forest monks who are meditators, so it's very good merit. When we share merits, please say sadhu, rejoice, and move on to a better place. That's all I said. After that, we left. Then, about a week or so later, the boss of Spritzer invited us. Initially, it was not the boss who invited us for the first ceremony. The first dana was invited by the Buddhist workers themselves. But the second one was invited by the boss himself, the boss of Spritzer. It was a thanksgiving ceremony because we managed to clear the ghost (laughs) from their quarters. So I went back there and I asked the women's workers, are you sure he's no longer there? He said, yeah, after you left, we didn't feel any disturbances in the quarters anymore. After the dana, I went to the quarters to check out. So I went there and the energy was okay. Now, it's just a single visit. You just need to educate the living and the dead. There's also another story. This one happened many years ago, even before I started SBS, more than 30 years ago. I had one Buddhist friend. She is also a meditator, a practitioner. And one of her friends bought a new apartment in Penang, moved into a new apartment, and soon after, she was murdered. She was single, but she was murdered. And when they went to the wake, you have this, uh, the coffin, and in front of the coffin, you have the photograph of the deceased, correct? This is Chinese custom. Then my friend went to sit in front of the coffin. She saw that the picture of the deceased in the photograph looks very, very dissatisfied. The face was very bokam, not satisfied. And the sister of the deceased also said she dared not go into the toilet because she knows the ghost is hiding inside the toilet. This dumb friend of mine sat in front of the coffin, in front of the photo, and gave her a long dhamma talk on forgiveness and saying that this is probably your past karma. Your coming debt, you did something to this person and now you have to pay your coming debt. No point holding on, no point having a grudge. Even though you know who killed you, there's nothing you can do about it. It's done. So better for you to forgive and to move on. She talked to her for a long time and eventually the picture changed and came back to her normal picture. But that's not the end of the story. Soon after that, this friend of mine, she took a bus or train to Kota Tinggi in Johor. She was a student of Reverend Sujivo, so she went there for a retreat. Now this ghost followed her to Kota Tinggi, and in the evening when she was meditating in the hall, the ghost appeared, but it was only half the body. It was very bright, and the ghost came, appeared in front of her, and said, I come here to say thank you, because I'm moving on. Thank you for telling me, for giving me the Dharma talk. If not, I would have been stuck there for a long time. Actually, she came to say goodbye and after that she disappeared. She went on to a better place. You see, it's very important to give proper education. It is not the chanting. It is the education that you give to the deceased and to the living. If you just chant without doing any explanation, nobody knows what is happening. We chant in Pali, you don't even know what we chant. Correct? <laughs> I'll give you another story. This time, this is a story also, it happened in Taiping. This young lady, she is the daughter of the mistress of uh, Buki. 
You know what bookie is? The one who does the uh, illegal numbers. This bookie had a legal wife, but he preferred to stay with the mistress. That's where he had his bookie office also. Towards the end of his life, he had cancer and he passed away in the hospital. After that, they transferred the body back to the legal wife's house and had the funeral there. But the ghost preferred to stay in the mistress's house. So he'd come back to stay in his room in the mistress's house and he would haunt that room. He wouldn't let anybody come to his room. And when you go into the toilet, you can smell the hospital smell in the toilet. So even when the mistress came to sleep in the room, he would come and disturb the mistress. He was so attached to his room. And that happened for 10 over years. <laughs> it has been happening for so long. Over 10 years. And this young lady, one day, she came to us when we were having Ghana somewhere in teams. I don't know whether the new building was rebuilt, but we had Dana down at the foothill, and she came to ask our help. So I said, okay, see what we can do. After we took our food, we went to the mistress' house, and then we just sat outside at the lounge. She didn't do any Dana. We just sat there, and we started to chant Meta Sutta. And while we were chanting, I felt a bit strange. So I told Aisma Kumara, to give a talk in Hokkien because my Hokkien wasn't very good at that time. He talked to the deceased and told him that uh, you are no longer of this world, like what I said, and if you hang around, you are actually creating problem for yourself and for the living as well. Why don't you see that you are actually suffering because you are still hanging around, because you are clinging on, holding on to something? Look at the cause of your suffering. You're suffering, you're hanging around because you're clinging on to something. Look at that as the cause of your suffering. Why don't you let go? Realize that your suffering is caused by your clinging. As he was talking to the deceased, and then the daughter was sitting there on the floor and she started to burst out crying. And later she told us she didn't know why she cried. You know, she just cried. Probably the father sort of possessed her. We only went there once. There was no dana. We didn't do any special chanting, just do metta and gave a dhamma talk. And that settled it. Finish. So that, whenever this lady came to do dana, we asked her, is everything okay? Is still having any haunting in the house? He says, no more. It's actually very simple. It's not the chanting. It's the education. You don't need a monk. Anyone, he just needs to go there and tell the living and the deceased to let go. The first thing that we do when we go for bereavement service, well, they do dana for us, and after the dana, we do a bit of chanting, and then after that, we give this dhamma talk. We talk to the deceased and to the living. We tell the deceased and the living, we describe the situation to them, that the deceased may still be hanging around. If you're hanging around, it's because... You are stuck here due to some attachment. Don't be attached to anything in this world. This world is no longer yours. Move on to a better place. And then we also tell the living to do the same thing. You don't have any attachments to the deceased. Don't say that you should stay back, you know, and settle your business before you go. How can you leave me to take care of the children? Now who's going to take care of the children and so forth? You know, if you have all these thoughts, then you're holding the person back. You cannot go on. Yes, this is a story of another person. He is a Christian. But he had a lot of Buddhist friends. He was a very generous man. He did a lot of fundraising for his alma mater, his school, a private Chinese school in Taipei. One day, there was a dinner in a hotel. In the middle of dinner, he went out because he said he wanted to go to the toilet or something. But they couldn't find his body after that. It disappeared. For the next few days, they were searching, searching, cannot find, don't know where he disappeared to. And finally, they found him drowned. He drowned in a drain. Probably he was trying to urinate into the drain, and then maybe he felt dizzy, and he fell in and knocked himself onto a stone. It's actually a, a little stream with a little bridge across. And when they discovered the body, part of his body had been eaten up 
by uh, monitor lizard. Found it quite late. Huh? During the wake, a lot of his Buddhist friends went there and they also tried to talk to the wife, to ask the wife to wish him well, wherever he may be. Then the wife was, couldn't understand. He said, how can you wish him well when he leaves me alone here to take care of my children? He's like he's running away and letting me take care of the children. And he just cannot understand the logic. If the surviving person has still this clinging, clinging that this disease should not go, he should still be around to help me, then this person could get stuck there for a long time. Even though the disease may let go, but if the living does not let go, the bond is still there. So it's very important for both parties to be able to let go. Letting go is another thing. One other thing is having a grudge. Attachment is one thing. Having a grudge because somebody offended you and you haven't forgiven that person and you want to take revenge. That is also another form of attachment. This is another story. Someone in BM died. Some of our devotees from Taiping went over because he was a relative of one of our devotees. And one of those people who went over there was a semi-psychic. She could see all these beings. When she arrived at the wake at night, she saw the deceased standing behind one woman and knocking at her head. <laughs> Obviously, the deceased was very angry at this woman. This semi-psychic who saw this scene didn't know who that woman was. Later on, she asked, who is that woman sitting there? And she found that it was the daughter. <laughs> it seems that the mother was very upset with the daughter. This is one of the things that can also make a deceased get stuck in a place because of you're not happy, you have a grudge. If you bear a grudge, that is also a form of attachment. During the bereavement service, during our Dhamma talks, we will ask both parties to let go and both parties to forgive one another. It's very important. Let go and forgive. Let go means letting go not only of your attachment to that person, but also attachment to property, to name, and so forth. Especially rich and powerful people, they are attached to their power, to their authority, to their property. And because of that, they can also be attached. They get stuck in that realm. Well, here's another story of a monk in Burma. This is a monk in Burma, the abbot of one monastery. After he died, nobody dared to stay in the monastery because he haunted the place. There was one Burmese man who was a very fearless man. He says he's not afraid of anything. I won't mind going to try to stay in the monastery. So he went to stay in the monastery. And sure enough, at night, the ghost of the late abbot came to see him. And uh, this person, being a fearless man, he fought with the ghost. He wrestled and fought with the ghost. And in the process, he knocked off a hat, something that the ghost was wearing. And when he knocked off the hat, then the ghost could talk. And then the ghost said, Oh, thank you so much. All those people who came here to say, I've been trying to communicate with them, to ask them to help me. But they think that I was trying to scare them. It's because I cannot talk. <laughs> but now you knock off this stuff, I can talk. And I want you to please help me. I have some property that I'm buried in a certain place. You please go and recover this property. And then you take part of it. Go and make a sangadana. Go and invite monks, make a sangadana and... Uh, share the marriage with me. Then the rest of it, you can have it. You get a commission. Uh. <laughs> so this guy did it. He went to the place, he covered the money, and he took a part of it, and a part of it, he made Sangadana, transferred married to this uh, abbot, and then the monastery was clean again. <laughs> you see? What imprisons a person into that intermediate state is his or her attachment. The more you are attached, the longer you stay. So it's very important to tell the living and the deceased 
to let go of all attachments, whether to animate or inanimate objects, and also to forgive one another. That's how we do it in SBS. There is also one sutta in the Kurika Nikaya called the Tirokutta Sutta. This is the only sutta in the whole Tibitaka that talks about what happens to a person after he dies. In this sutta it says that after a person dies, the departed one, he may come back, but he cannot come into the house. He will stay outside and stand at the crossroads or outside the door. While the surviving members of the family are having a feast, they just look on and they cannot get any benefit from it. Then the verse says that the surviving members of the family should have compassion and offer food that is suitable for the departed ones. The reason why they are standing outside, according to the Sutta, is because of their bad karma. Because of the bad past karma, the living relatives don't think about them and don't invite them to come and partake of food offerings. Then the next verse talks about encouraging the living relatives to have compassion for the deceased and to offer food to them which are suitable and clean. When the departed ones know about this, they can come in and then they rejoice in the food that was offered to them and they wish the living relatives well. May you live long because of you. We now can get this. When we chant, Idang wo nyati nam ho tu sukita hon tu nyatayo, this actually comes from this sutta. It's one verse from this sutta. Idang wo nyati nam ho tu means, may this be for you all relatives. Sukita hon tu nyatayo. May the relatives be well and happy. This is the meaning of the chant. In this sutta, it seems that they are making offerings, material offerings, like what we Chinese do during Cheng Beng and Poto. After the verse talking about the departed ones wishing the living relatives well, it describes there is no making of livelihood in the world of the departed ones. They have no merchants, they cannot do husbandry, they cannot deal in silver and gold, but they depend on what is given here by the living. And then it goes on to say, give two similes. One is saying that rain that has fallen on higher ground will naturally flow towards the lower ground. That's one simile. The second simile is all the rivers and streams flow towards the sea. So in the same way, what is given here by the living reaches those departed ones. Therefore, one should have compassion for the departed ones by thinking, oh, he was my friend, he was my relative, and so forth, and make offerings on their behalf, or make offerings to them. This first view, 10 or so verses, seems to talk about making material offerings. But the last few verses suddenly introduces the Sangha. He says, what is given to the Sangha is well given and it will reach the departed ones immediately. By giving this to the Sangha, one has fulfilled one's duty as a relative and one has also given the Sangha the bhikkhu's strength. This is how we concluded this sutta. In this sutta, we can see that there are actually two sections. One section is talking about making material offerings. This is in case the departed one happens to be reborn in a realm that depends on what is given by the living. Not everyone who passes away will go into that realm. There's another sutta called Janu Soni Sutta in the Anguttara Nikaya. But this Brahmin Jano Soni approached the Buddha and asked him. He said, Master Gautama, we Brahmins give out of faith. And we wonder whether what we give 
will reach the departed ones. Then the Buddha said, well, it depends. If the circumstances are right, then it will reach. If not, it will not reach. Then the Brahmin asked, what are the circumstances that are right? And the Buddha says, well, if one is reborn in the lower realms, the hell, then whatever is given by living relatives will not reach them because their food is hell food. This is their karma. It's not what you are given here now. If they are born as animals also, what you are giving may not reach them because they are elsewhere, not where you are offering the food. And their food is also animal food. If they are born as devas also, they won't be able to get. But if they are born in the Petivisya, Petivisya is a Pali word for the ghostly realm, then they will be able to get what you offer to them. Then Brahmin asks, what if our intended departed relative is not born in the ghostly realm? then uh, what we give will be gone to waste, isn't it? Then the Buddha says, no, it will not be gone to waste because in this samsara with an inconceivable beginning, there cannot be someone who is not related to you. Even though another departed one may not be directly related to you in this life, he may have been related to you in the past life. Even though your intended departed one may not be born in that ghostly realm to receive your offering, somebody else who is related to you could. So it is still beneficial. Then the Buddha concluded by saying, anyway, the giver also is not without benefit. By giving also, as a giver, by giving, that itself is a good deed and it has its own merits. To sum up, what we can do nowadays is uh, we follow our Chinese custom. We can still make offerings to the departed one. Then we can still uh, invite the monks to come. But most importantly, it is to educate the deceased and the living on what happens immediately after death. To tell both parties to let go of all attachments, whether animate or inanimate, and also to forgive one another. I shall stop here and open up to the floor for questions. Any questions? Thank you, Bhante, for the talk. How do we deal with old people? They are sick when they talk about wanting to go but cannot go. They cannot go because they have uh, attachment. Sometimes it's like that. Sometimes someone is in a coma and then the favorite grandchild has not come back yet. He's in the US or something. So they'll hold on, hold on until the grandchild comes back and then you see it, then they will go. <laughs> <laughs> this is uh, attachment. I'll tell you another interesting story. One of my recent Hokkien retreat, there was one yogi. She's a researcher educationist for mat- mathematics. She's now probably in early 60s or late 50s. But her husband died at a very young age. I think maybe around 40. Now both of them were very devout Buddhist practitioners even when they were studying in university. And they were also very health conscious. Then somehow... One day, it was found that the husband had lung cancer. He had only three weeks to live. When the doctor made that announcement to her, the first thing she thought was, why should it be us? And then, uh, later another thought came, why not us? It could be anybody. And the husband was a very diligent practitioner. He did not panic, although the wife panicked. But the husband did not panic. He was very calm. And he said, well, what to do? There's life. Then he refused any morphine, any painkiller, until the few hours before he died, when the pain was very excruciating. All the while, he had been meditating, even when he was sick, and he had been able to bear with the pain without moans or complaints. But towards the end of his life, 
he noticed that his face was cringing, like he was trying to fight with the pain. And the doctor also advised them to administer morphine because the pain was too extreme for him to take. They followed the doctor's advice, they administered morphine, and soon after that, the husband became delirious. The husbands usually would talk, would use Mandarin to communicate with the wife. But after they administered morphine, he started to talk in English to her and started to talk about his project, his ongoing project that he was working on. So the wife knew that he was getting delirious. At that time also, the in-laws, they saw that he was going. And so the in-laws wanted to save him. And they started to look for Gyakang. You know, it's Gyakang, spider. Any spider? Picking a spider to boil spider soup for him to drink. Because it was the belief that you boil spider soup, <laughs> then you will revive the patient. And so when she heard it, she quickly talked to the husband. Hey, hey look at me, look at me. I'm going to go to the house. 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 I said, quickly, go quickly. Don't worry about me. I know how to take care of myself. I know how to take care of my children. At that time, they had two young kids. And said, your parents are going to bring this spider soup. So you better go, quickly. <laughs> So soon after that, he went. He cannot save really before he stayed back. Then another day, soon after my recent Sutta workshop in Penang, one of the participants asked me, he said he had a 90-year-old father. He is so sick. Should one wish that he should stay on, hold on, or should one wish that he should go? Which is more correct? What do you think? I think sometimes with my mom, uh, we are also in that position she was always talking about joining my father, but can't, and she was suffering. You are sort of lost, whether to say, go, 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 or <laughs> then you feel very heartless, you see, to talk to her like that. Sometimes it's keeping quiet, I think, is the best solution without having to hurt her. You could just say, don't worry about us, we can take care of ourselves. You don't have to be attached to anything, everything here is already settled. If you want to go, you can go peacefully. You can say that. But actually what I told this lady was that whether to move on or to hold on, I told her, we don't really know what is best for that person. It's like during the Buddha's time, this comes in the Pitta Vatu. There was one criminal who was being tortured to death. And somebody, I think it was another deva, who advised this person to hold on to your life as long as you can because your suffering after this will even be worse. <laughs> say, hold on as fast as you can, you know, he's suffering, he's now being tortured to death, but you say, your suffering after death in hell will be worse than what you're suffering now. So hold on to it, don't die so fast. <laughs> so we don't really know what's going to happen after death, correct? So I advise her, the best thing you can do is wish that conditions will be such that it will help you to you achieve your highest good. May conditions conduce to your highest good, whatever that could mean. It could mean moving on or it could mean holding on. We just let come out inside. But we wish for the well-being of the person, whatever happens. Bante, could you talk about last thought moment? Talk about last thought moment. That's also a very controversial thing. When does death actually occur? In a recent National Geographic magazine, somebody sent me a link to that. There were some scientists who made the research on what happens after death. And they found that it is not a clear-cut black and white case. It is a grey area. Death or dying is a spectrum and you can actually come back. You go there and you can come back because of modern technology. People who are declared brain dead, they can actually come back. There are many stories like that. When does death actually occur? It's not as clear-cut as what the Orthodox Theravadins believe. What happens uh, in accounts of near-death experience where people are declared clinically or brain dead, but then they come back and they relate what happens to them is that 
they were still conscious. Although the five senses are already, you could say, dead in a sense, but the mind is still very alive, and they can perceive things with their mind, they can travel with their mind, they can see what's happening, and they can even read the minds of the people in the hospital room. They also say that once the mind leaves the body, then the excruciating pain that they suffered while in the body terminates, is cut off completely. No more pain really, but the mind is still there, the mind is still very alert, the mind knows what's happening. So when is the last thought moment? We don't know. If he comes back again, there's not a last thought moment because he's living. <laughs> and it's from there he goes off. You know, that's the last thought moment. We don't know. So we only know the stories of those who came back. How about those who didn't come back? What happens to them? <laughs> we don't know. <laughs> Thank okay. you, Bante. Yes, there's one, someone behind. Good evening. Is it true that people who die very bad death, they have a very bad karma, who die very bad, very terrible way? Like an accident? Like an accident. They suffer, not on die on the spot. The spirits are there lah, around them, isn't it? Huh? Is it true that they will have to go through a very bad uh, state after death? Lah? And uh, compared to those who die very peacefully, with the loved ones around them and people chanting prayers, then they go off peacefully. It really depends on many circumstances. If somebody dies peacefully with loved ones around, but the loved ones still have a lot of attachment, that person can still be stuck there. But people who suffered badly and they die, depends on their state of mind. Do they have a lot of grudges? Do they want to take vengeance? Or do they want to take revenge? then if they have such thoughts, they might be stuck there. There will be a spirit or a ghost trying to punish the person who was responsible for their suffering. And that's what these ghosts are. Because they're haunting the place due to their own attachments to their grudges. Yet there are people who suffered badly and they die, but they don't have such grudges. They may go on to a good place. So it's very difficult to say. But the chances of going to a good place if you die with a very negative state of mind, it's not good. I don't think you stand a good chance of being in a good place. But we really don't know what happens to a person, to his mental state after he dies. Like I said just now, if he's separated from his body, it's another world altogether. It's very peaceful and calm, and you may have a different state of mind. It's just a sharing experience. I have a friend... She's a very spiritual person like in her 50s. She, when she prays, she says to God, please give me as much suffering as I can so that I won't be born again in this world. Because she believes that the next world is much a happier place. Now. So give me as much so that I, I finish all my sufferings before I move on so that I don't come back to this world. And then her, one of her close brother or sister, somebody passed away in her family and they all had an agreement. None of them should cry. And they didn't cry. And in fact, they had a kind of a make it like a carnival kind of thing so that the spirit lives happily. I feel it's a noble way of telling that you're going to a better world. I mean, this is just what she shared with me. Thank you. That's only her belief. She's only said her belief that by getting as much suffering now, then you don't have to suffer in the next world. But our Buddhists don't believe in that way because it doesn't mean that if you suffer a lot now, you'll be free from other sufferings which are the result of a past bad karma. <laughs> it can come at other times. I'm trying to say is that they're trying to tell the, the spirit that we are not having any attachment with you and that we are sending you off. There's no attachment both sides. <laughs> yeah, there's no attachment on both sides and there's a good chance that the spirit can really go you know, to a good destination. No, anyone else? Yes, you be. When you talk about educating the disease, must it be done through the verbal way or can it be done through the mental way? Both. It can be done both ways. Because they can read your mind. <laughs> Sometimes it's better to verbalize it rather than do it in your mind. Yes, no more. Thank you, Bhante, for the talk. I have a related question to Sister Shubi. 
If let's say the relative is far in another country, so I pray or verbalize to the deceased from here, can it be heard? Like can it, why not? I mean, space is only a concept. I also have a personal sharing. Last month, I went home because my mom called me and said, "Come back immediately. We never know when your father will leave." So he said, "Maybe your father." Is waiting for you to come home, because his situation wasn't looking good. So I went back and I saw him, and he was in hospital. He said he missed me very much. I accompanied him with my mom in hospital for a few days, and he got better. What interesting is, my mom told me that doctors were very amazed that he's still alive. Because he lived with a very low blood count, that any time any normal person would have bleed to death, but my father was still live for many months. So that's why we thought maybe when I go back, he'll be more peaceful to live. He still lives. I did talk to him. Is there something holding you back? Is there something you still want to do that you don't want to live because you're suffering now? Is that actually I'm so much in pain? I prefer to go. To die as soon as possible, but if I'm given a year, I still want to finish my project. <laughs> This is a bit, a bit, but not a line lah. What he wish for, so I'm also confused. Then I ask him that. So what is it that will make you more peaceful? Uh, he said, mm, I would really love to make more money. <laughs> so as a daughter, I'm really speechless already. He said he's a communist. Communist and Buddhist, somewhat communist. We don't believe in God, right? I share with him a bit about Buddhism, about letting go, about how you should actually think more about your the good deeds you have done. And then he convert to Christian. Also, the doctor, he's a he kind of like preach in the hospital to him. Also, ask him to read, read about. Do you know where to go after you die? So I share with him all this. Then he look at me in the eye. He said, "I don't, I don't believe these things." Bante, what do you think as a daughter I should do? Because I see him suffering, I pity him as well, and I don't want him to leave the world with such a this kind of thoughts. He was he was he was a non-believer, and then he converted to Christianity by the doctor. No, when he was still okay, there is a priest that is pretty good. Like come to the house, uh, share with the family about Christian. My grandma was also the pai pai one, ah, do offering the Chinese believers. My grandma is the one that said, "Hey, come, everybody, become Christian." So left me and my sister, who's still a Buddhist. The rest is Christian. <laughs> Actually, I don't really mind when I read their Bible. It's pretty much like Buddhism in a way. He's Christian, but he he doesn't really read Bible. He doesn't really believe in God. So I'm a bit confused as well. <laughs> yeah, actually, I'm a bit confused now. As a daughter, what should we do? Can you give some suggestion? <laughs> so he's still okay now. <laughs> That's a difficult situation. To be in. You ask him why you want to make so much money? Because he used to have a lot of money and then he got bankrupt. He used to be a boss of a company, and then there's a grudge related to it. My uncle was a project manager, and he actually betrayed the family and uh, the business, and then he corrupted the whole money, and then got bankrupt. So he hold grudges towards the uncle and my mom. So he blame everybody. Especially my mom and my uncle for making him poor. He told me I got no money now. Your mother control the money. He want to make money for himself so he can have the control again. The control and money is what is driving him up until today. Oh, I see. It's very strong attachment material, I would say. It's not easy to talk him over. I don't think I can give any advice at the moment. <laughs> you have to do more metta to him to soften his heart first. Before you talk to him, logic won't appeal. And this time you must talk heart to heart. Okay. About haunted houses, I've seen the movie on The Conjuring by directed by James Wan. It's a true movie. What's uh, the name of the movie? Conjuring. Conjuring. Yeah, directed by Sarawakian okay. James Wan. What is it about? It's a, it's a based on a true story where a house is haunted and and a very difficult time. The members who, whoever stayed there, you know, they had a very difficult time. The spirits disturbing them and all that. And finally, they made use of a psychic to come in and to clean up the place. And then there was a history before that. You know what happened in that house 
and uh, what happened. And so the psychic, I think they did some prayers, I think. So that helped, I think. If I'm not mistaken, I saw the movie. Sometimes they have people who want to communicate with the dead. They call them the media or something. They communicate with the dead and they have the voice of the dead telling them what are they doing and all that. But uh, still, at the end of the day, we must try to, through prayers only, we can please them, isn't it? Eh? During this conversation with the dead, certain people, they have the powers to communicate. So when they have that kind of powers where they're anxious to see the other party is disturbing them, so it, it is important to communicate with them and try to please them. Sometimes you need more than that. Uh-huh. Uh, you know, all this white ma- magic and the black magic. Yeah. The white magicians and the black magicians, they are fighting with one another. <laughs> mm. And this happens in many cultures. So I wouldn't want to go and get involved in the spirit world. Very dangerous. Very dangerous. Right. I just like to ask a question. When a person is having some terminal illness, suffering, I think in the Western world, they will ask a doctor to inject themselves with some little chemicals to put themselves away. So in the Buddhist uh, practice, is it acceptable? You mean euthanasia, is it? I mean, if it's an active thing like injecting some chemicals to kill yourself, that is not encouraged. That, that is not ethically correct in Buddhism. But if you disconnect the life support system and then you die naturally, then that's a different matter. If you inject something, that's a different matter. But this is a self-request. Self-request, you write there something and say that, well, from the Buddhist point of view, that's not ethical. Because you're taking life. Your own life. Yeah, any life. It doesn't matter whether it's your own life or other people's life. Okay. Bante, uh, thanks for the talk. I have one question. Is Nowadays, it's quite a trend to donate the organs. <laughs> but I read somewhere that, I mean, the, from the Buddhist point of view, is that it, you may sign on the paper when you're alive, but when you're actually about to go and you have to be, you know, your eyes, your cornea, your organs have been taken away, it's actually a very painful and very difficult process. And it may maybe make you harder to go in peace. Well, I mean, what's your view on this? <laughs> this is quite a controversial question. So is it to do it or not to do it? It's up to you. The risk is there, we don't really know. Because they have to harvest it immediately after you're pronounced uh, clinically dead. Clinically dead or brain dead, immediately after that. Because you cannot tell it. Yeah, and you mentioned about the grey zone, right? Uh, when is actually dead. Right, it's right, that right. Nobody exactly, exactly. So it's not as clear-cut as that. Anything could happen. Can I ask one more question? Uh, yeah. This is uh, my situation here. Is My father, he's 70 years old. And my grandma, she's 92 maybe. And uh, my father is very filial, very xiaosun, jin wu hao. But then in the last five years, my grandma's health is very bad. So he was in and out hospital maybe already three times. But every time... She went to the hospital, my dad will look after her even more. Like, uh, he would massage her for two hours every day. He would carry her as well. So he's 70 years old and he would still carry her down the steps. And every time my grandma will recover from very serious uh, illness, like hospitalized, tube is already in the throat, and she will recover. Oh. And again and again. Uh, this is probably the third time. All right. Um, so I think in this case, it looks like my father is like, doesn't want her to, because he is so familiar. So I saw uh, So, so how do I deal with this? When, when we talk to my father also, right, he say, he's my mother, what do you expect me to do? And we also don't know what to say to him. Let it be, I mean, that he enjoys doing it as part of his gratitude towards the mother. But my grandma actually also in pain. Uh, actually, when he goes to the hospital, they have to insert tube. That is very painful, actually. Yeah. We cannot say this because the father, he may like to do this. Have you tried explaining to your father about this? Yeah, actually it's hard. You, you explain to them and they have to understand. If they don't, then you have to bear with it. That's part of your suffering. <laughs> okay.